Now besides all the different ways that you can gaff dice, there are certain things that you can do with unrigged dice. Things like specialty throws. Uh, let's say uh, you, want, you already have established your point and you don't want to get a 7. So you would put the aces facing the same way and you would roll the dice as opposed to throwing them regularly. When they're rolled out, they're less likely to come up on those numbers because of the way that it's thrown. The dice will roll as opposed to tumbling like they're supposed to. All of these throws take a great deal of practice, but they do produce results. Uh, another way of doing it would be um, the slide. This is where one die is held the way that you want it to land, and the other die is shaken loosely in your hand. So it sounds like you're mixing, you're mixing the dice correctly, but when you throw it, that one die goes flying and catches the eye while the other die just slides along in the position that you left it in. Then you have a throw that's called a slide or a bounce slide. That's where the two dice are thrown together, but the first die is going, if they're thrown together correctly, they'll stay together in flight and they'll hit the wall. One die will bounce off and slide back the way it was while the other die rolls around. Back when these dice throws were prevalent, people came up with the bright idea of using a dice cup. The thinking behind the dice cup is that if you're not holding the dice, you can't actually control what they do. The thinking on this is a little bit wrong because even with a dice cup you can't actually control the dice to some degree. I'll give an example by stacking the dice here for you. This is called the stack. That's a stack. Call this in the quick stack. Then you have the double time stack. You might try the scoop stack. You can always try pitching in the dice. For a real challenge, try tiny dice. people learn the ease of controlling dice even with the use of a cup, the next step in the evolution of dice technology was the advent of the dice horn, like this one recovered from the attic of an early 1800 farmhouse. A dice horn was used in games like Hazard, which is where craps comes from. The dice were placed in the top of the horn, rattled around the bottom, and poured back out the top. This made it very difficult for regular dice to be controlled and ensuring that the dice rolled out randomly. It worked much the same way as a ridge lip in a modern dice cup works. The dice have to roll across the ridge, making it difficult to control what they do inside the cup. A good quality dice horn was made of leather like this one and were very expensive. If you couldn't afford a good leather horn, cheaper ones were made of tin. This is where the expression tin horn comes from, that you hear in a lot of old westerns. A tin horn gambler was someone who used a cheap tin horn, but pretended to be a man of means. The term came to mean cheap imitation, or someone posing as something they weren't. Next was the invention of the dice cage. This was used in games like chuck -a This is a very old cage, and it's actually stamped with the date that it was manufactured. January 2nd, 1874. With the cage, the dice are not handled at all, but are spun inside the cage to determine where they land. 
Chuckaluck is played by betting on numbers 1 through 6 to come up on the three dice inside the cage. If you bet on number 1 and it came up on one of the dice, you won back your money. If it came up on two of the dice, you won two times your money. And if it came up on all three dice, you won three times your original wager. At first glance, it looks like the odds are in favor of the player. But if you do the math of all the possible combinations that can come up, the house has about an 8% advantage when even money is bet on all the numbers. Even with this large advantage, it was not unheard of for loaded dice to be used, since no one was able to closely examine the dice inside the cage. Most casinos won't allow the game, but you still might see it in some fundraisers or carnivals. Chuckaluck was originally a British public game called Sweet Cloth. When it first came to the U.S. around 1800, it was called Sweet. It has also been called Chuck, Chuckerluck, Chuckluck, Big Six, and Birdcage. A game called Crown and Anchor is played exactly the same way as chuck a -luck, but instead of numbers on the dice, you have the four card suits, clubs, diamonds, spades, and hearts, and a crown and an anchor. Crown and Anchor is very popular during World War I and is still played in many places around the world. The game of Grand Hazard is played the same way as chuck a -luck, but has a table layout for betting with many more options and even worse odds for the players. As I mentioned before, the game of craps comes from an English game called Hazard from the early 1800s. In the English version of Hazard, when you rolled a losing number, it was called crabs. When the French brought the game to New Orleans, they mispronounced crabs as creps, and the, and the American Negro mispronounced that as craps. Craps was much more of a back alley game in the South than its dignified father Hazard. At least until Pullman trains became popular. That's when the game started really traveling around. By World War I, servicemen and businessmen alike were playing the game wherever they went. All you needed was a pair of dice and some money to play with. Craps is the fastest of the table games. Gamblers either love it or hate it, and there's not much in between. Unlike other gambling games, it matters a great deal where you bet your money on the table. The best bets that you can make when playing craps are the pass, don't pass, and come and don't come once the number's been rolled. Other than that, ignore them. They're all bad odds, and the savvy craps player avoid them like the plague. If you see a guy yelling, come on, double fours, baby needs a new pair of shoes, his child probably does need shoes because his father's an idiot. The best bet you can make in craps is the don't pass bet after the point has been established. Basically, this means that you are betting that the shooter will you are betting on the shooter to lose. Even though odds wise this is playing smart, the other players would consider you a wrong better and don't like you. If you choose to be a wrong better, keep a low profile. Your cheering when everyone else is losing can get you in a lot of unpleasant situations with the other players. Some other basic advice is to blend in with the other players, but don't interact with them. If it's the first time you're playing at the craps table and you're a man, don't let on because it's considered bad luck for the table. It's opposite if you're a woman. One other thing to watch out for is the different layouts and the layout designs. Even though the odds are in favor of the house on every roll, some small time houses set up odds that are even worse. What I have here is called a jip layout. The casinos are not really cheating you because the odds are printed right on the table. On the jip layout, it reads 541, which is the same as 421, but looks like better odds to the uneducated player. Make a cork float in the middle of a glass. For this, all you need is a cork and a glass of water. If you drop a cork into a glass of water, pretty quickly the cork is going to work itself over to the edge of the glass and stay there. Now, the bet is that you're going to try and make the cork stay in the middle of the glass. 
So for this one, you get a cork, drop it in a glass of water, it's going to float to the side. You move it back to the middle, it floats to the other side. Pretty much anywhere you put it, it's going to float to the side. You bet that you can make it stay in the middle of the glass and not float to the side. The way to do that is by adding some extra water all the way up to the rim. And just beyond the rim, a little bit extra water beyond the edge of the rim increases the surface tension of the water. So the water is actually above the rim of the glass. A little bit more. There it goes. Right to the middle and cannot get all the way to the edge because there's too much surface tension at the edge of the glass. The cork will float right there in the middle. I hope you've enjoyed this first episode of the Grifters Game Room and my presentation on dice. If you click the subscribe button, each week you'll get an email update letting you know when new content has been uploaded. You can check me out on thegrifter.com or email me at keith at thegrifter.com if you have any questions or comments. Hope you've enjoyed the show.